If you watch Common Ground online, consider becoming a member or making a donation at lptv.org. Lakeland PBS presents Common Ground, brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Production funding of Common Ground is made possible in part by First National Bank Bemidji, continuing their second century of service to the community, a partnership for generations. Member FDIC. Welcome to Common Ground. I'm your host, Scott Knudsen. In this episode, join Aaron Spangler in two inlets as he creates a work for the Sculpture Garden at the Walker Art Center. May of 2016, internationally exhibited artist Aaron Spangler invited me to his Two Inlet studio to film him sculpt a piece for the Walker Art Center Sculpture Garden in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I drove past beautiful Itasca State Park to Aaron's studio on the headwaters. His abstract carved form had taken shape and Aaron was adding detail to the surface. Victoria Sung of the Walker Art Center was there to talk with Aaron about the creation of his art. So what does it feel like walking around in here? It's great. I mean, it's incredible to see, you know, everything that he's working on, the smell of the wood. It's, everything's just very evocative. All of your senses are engaged. You know, I started using these patterns where I trace off of tools or bodies. So I'm using that technique that I... Um, had with the uh, woodblock prints on the sculpture. Got it. So like, for instance, this is, um, this is my uh, deer rifle. Yeah. And then. Um, so these are objects from your everyday life? Yeah, so most of the stuff is from here, you know, from stuff I had. And then once I ran out of things to trace, or there's like only like a few things I can think of and I can't think of more things, then my assistant would go and find more stuff. And once we exhausted that, um, her parents have a, uh, uh, her grandparents are kind of junk collectors. So she went there and totally, uh, you know, traced all that stuff. And so a lot of this is a mix of all that. It doesn't really matter what they are. They're really just shapes. I don't know, ex I mean, I know this is like a, um, a pruner. This is something that's a crossing from my son's toys. This is um, what I call like a gun face which is a pistol just oh, yeah. you know, becomes like a animal face. Right. And you trace them from the actual objects themselves? Um, usually sometimes and sometimes photos, the photos I've taken and then you can cut that out. What do you think? I think I know what this is. This is a sprinkler. Oh. <laughs> right? I think. Yeah. I see it. Sets yeah. in the ground. <laughs> yeah. This is off of an old um, two-man saw of my great grandpa's. Kind of a cool thing. What's this? It's like a, a lamp or? Yeah, it could be. Oh yeah, it could be a lamp. I never thought about that. Either yeah, way, yeah. Is. This is a mystery to me. This looks like some kind of a gear with cams or I, I don't know yeah. what this is. Anyway, so all this stuff, it doesn't really matter what it is. And so you're interested in these more for their kind of abstracted properties as opposed to <clears throat> the actual object they represent? As a whole, all these tools together um, express something but mm -hmm. it's not a specific thing you right. know it's just you know just the act of using basic stupid things around you know and then creating patterns out of that and um and then those create other things and create images that can become uh they, they come become figures i would say right almost, you know so let's see i'm gonna try something up here this is um my uh, Marlin rifle that my uncle bought for me <clears throat> for deer hunting. 30 <clears> 30 <throat> uh, lever action. So, 
Nothing too crazy. Let me know if I can hand you anything. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of this stuff has been, as you can see, is really worn. It's been used over and over and kind of uh, laid out in different ways. It's just, I like, part of why I like carving is it's a limitation, working reductively. It limits the choices. And part of just using these things over and over, and part of it's probably lazy, part of it's, you know, then I get inspired and like, or I just run out of objects to trace. And then part of it just doesn't really matter what it is. It's just uh, a way to get outside of my head and generate imagery and lines that wouldn't otherwise happen if I'm just staring at the wall. So after I trace these on, I'll erase parts of it. That's not all gonna get carved exactly like it is. But it's a place to begin, it's a place to start. It's a place to have something to say, to react to, you know. So if I start with somewhat arbitrary lines, then as things get narrowed down, I'm forced into decisions, sometimes forced into places that I'm un unhappy with, which then makes me upset and struggle and hate what I'm doing, and then forces me to make better decisions, or well, I don't know if they're better, but decisions that I can live with. Sometimes those aren't better decisions. Do you erase and start again, or do you add on other imagery <clears throat> that will? I find when, when there's things that I don't like, I have to let them sit for a while, mm -hmm. because often those things that make me uncomfortable for some reason um, have value, and that's how I learn from it. Right. You know, If it's all stuff that's going the way it should, it's usually not, you know, I, I don't grow, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, just like sometimes when you meet people, like people that you initially are kind of not drawn to become yeah. your best friends. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's a little bit of that. Well, these are kind of interesting because I feel like you're like amassing this stockpile of imagery that, you know, like recurs here and there throughout your artwork. Yep. And so you have your own like history of, you know, images or archetypes that you draw mm -hmm. upon, but then to that you're adding again more and more. I think it's also, it's like, what more can I do with these? You know, same with the chisels. Basic chisels, you have gouges and they come in all kinds of different sizes. Backbend gouges, which are really more for how you're getting into spaces, right? Mm -hmm. V gouges and then these kind of spoon Fishtail gouges, if you rock them, you can create different lines. But there's only so many things you can do with them. So it's like, how do you keep making new marks with them, yeah. right? So that's something that I've brought to the sculptures, which is basically using that surface technique of making a woodcut over a form. So the stencils are just another tool for you. Yeah, it's just like these, you yeah. know, it's another thing. And it just forces me to hopefully try to keep doing new things with it, yeah. you know? I'm definitely more of a more is more onslaught. Yeah. <laughs> Full on dense speed right. metal, you know. Um, so when I first started carving, uh, all I had was flat chisels like, uh, let's see. Now I can barely find a flat chisel, but just like these. Yeah. Somehow I, I did all my carving with these. And um, I had a friend of mine, uh, Paloma Vargas Weiss, who uh, also works with wood. And she's uh, in Dusseldorf. Um, and she came to my studio when I was in New York and she totally, it was, she couldn't believe it. She's like, this is ridiculous. This is what you work with. <laughs> yeah. And part of the reason was that I didn't want, you know, I didn't want the technique or the look of the technique from gouges because it looked like wood carving to me. Yeah. So like these uh, narrative reliefs, they're all done with flat chisels. When I graduated to gouges, everything got a lot faster and I realized uh, what a fool I'd been. And so the different effect you were saying between... The well, in the end, I mean, the gouges really just help you clear wood. Yeah. You know? So then as I had the gouges, you know, then I start looking at more wood carving and seeing how, you know, going you know, so far back, you know, everybody's using this language of these gouges. And you can see it in, you know, African sculptures, uh, Indonesian. You don't see it so much like in old, you know, European wood carving because they weren't letting the tools be seen. Mm -hmm. But I could see it in like African mask making. Yeah. Um, I was working at the Museum for African Art um, as an art installer and registrar. Okay. And so I got to handle a lot of this stuff. And at the time, I just, I didn't really, 
I didn't really think about like, I'm a wood carver, these are wood carvings. I just thought of them as something different until I don't know, one day it just dawned on me that I can see There's how they're making tradition. this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and using that language, you know. So I think it freed me up to think about using the, the chisels as the content and for mark making and, and, yeah. and being okay with that. Can you talk a little bit about how you got into wood carving? <clears throat> I know you don't have like a formal training. Yeah, um, I was making sculptures in college out of uh, found objects and the content was pretty similar, you know. It was a lot of uh, war stuff and, you know, guns and things like that, but um, I was making, you know, uh, sculptures out of found objects, a lot of found wood. Um, and there was at one point where I had this structure that I wanted to um, uh, carve murals in. In fact, it's out here kind of rotten. I can, do you want to go see it? Yeah, definitely. It's been rotting outside. Oh no. <laughs> so this structure was up on a platform that was a railroad platform. Yeah. And I, had built these railroad tracks out of old sheet metal and stuff. And so inside here, you can still see some of the remnants of the... Oh, that's incredible. So there was like these carved murals. Yeah. And then you'd look down in there, and that was a hole, and there was like a carving of uh, like hell with these mountains with upside-down crosses and tar on them. And, and so this was like a little, you could, you know, like someone could sit in there, not actually. But. Yeah. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so that was a... Those were the first. These were your first wood carvings. <laughs> mm -hmm. The way I was carving was so flat and mm -hmm. it was just a way to bring out the, uh, like to put a background in there and just, you know, just to what I had. I had a bucket of tar and I had one chisel. And so I started carving yeah. with that. So when so were these from? I graduated in 93, so it would have been 92, 93. This is from MCAD? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that. Got it. And then it was right after that that I started carving. From I started carving those. Yeah. And I got something about working with illusion and uh, bas relief, you know, this kind of right. tension between illusion and um, real, real sculptural death. space. Yeah. Which is like, well, I can kind of do it all in this. Yeah. So I really worked in just bas relief for a long time until then I just started to get more sculptural and then translate sort of a bas relief onto a sculpture, you know, in the round. And then that evolved into this more um, pattern uh, surface, like, like with the woodcuts. Yeah. So, and that's something I learned from doing the woodcuts. So when I did the woodcuts with High Point, I was, well, even before that, because I was making the woodcuts to make these rubbings, right? Yeah. I discovered something there that I could apply to the sculptures. So now it's kind of becoming a mixture of both of those things, going in and out of the, um, the, the woodcut relief and bringing some objects out, but not in this sculpture, it's all going to be yeah. surface. Got it. So. Yeah, it's an interesting merging because generally you think about, you know, bas relief, it's on a flat surface, mm -hmm. you're bringing out the three-dimensionality on that flat surface, but then you're applying it to the sculpture in the round as mm -hmm. well. So yeah. this merging of the two is very yeah. interesting and something yeah. that I, I don't see frequently. Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I can think of like, um, have you seen um, Chris Burden's uh, Medusa? I don't know it's, if I've seen like, that specific It's like this one. world. It's yeah. like, um, I mean, it's, it's just a crazy thing, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a, I would say it's a bas relief. It's all additive, you In know, the, but it's... Yeah. And so you carve out of basswood, yes. correct? Can you so these the... are, are glued up. This was one glued up block that was, um, I think it was about 33 inches by 35 inches, something like that. So all this has been carved away. Yeah, so the surface technique came from these panels, you know, that I was carving um, to make these rubbings. So I would take the pan, and this is another way, like these panels I use over and over and over, right? Mm -hmm. So, and they're just collaged. I move the piece around and rub certain parts. I don't rub the whole thing. And part of when I was making the panels, they were very free because I wasn't concerned about them being a total image. Right. I just, I knew that all I was going to do is rub parts of them. So it was like, I didn't really care like how it turned out. Yeah. As long as I could use parts of it. Yeah. Then, you know, they turned out interesting so that I could use those. But initially that's, that's how it was. So you can see these multiple parts over and over through here, you know, from many, many other panels. And these are just done with like a hard wax crayon. And uh, sometimes I've melted the crayon and smeared it. 
but um, but mostly it's just that, and um, and it, it just holds to it. And so I put that over the panel, I <clears throat> rub that with the crayon, and then I use a, a, a random orbital sander to kind of mix the colors and to also to fade the colors. Got it. So. So you use, so for pigments, you've used, you know, wax crayon, mm -hmm. the work I think in the Walker's collection. Yep. Yeah, that's um, the same technique. Yeah, and that's, yep. but we also have a sculptural work. I think it's, um, mm -hmm. I that's owe my soul a, to the company wood, yeah. store. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. is it charcoal or graphite? So or? that is um, a black gesso. Black with, gesso, uh, graphite. okay, with graphite yeah. on top of it, okay. Yeah. And what, what other pigments do you um, tend to use? Well, I've, you know, I've done some light, paint stains on wood, but mostly it's just that. It's yeah. like straight out of the box. Yeah. And, um, and the paint I use is just cheap paint I get at the Ben Franklin at the hobby yeah. store. <laughs> so the panels that you do carve and then you, you, know, you create these rubbings from, mm -hmm. are those also considered works of yours in their own right afterwards? Or? Well, the panels, they could be, but I would never want to get rid of them yeah. um, as far as you know, until I'm like ready to kick off because I, I keep using them. Yeah. You know, like for instance, making these drawings for this, I'm just, you know, to, to get texture, I'm just putting these on the panels and I'm just rubbing and it's just really quick. You know, I'm not, this isn't all like drawn out, right? Okay. So I get a shape okay. and then I can use that and it's a way to create like how something like that could feel. Got it. So like all, like pretty much all of this, is all done from that panel, right? From that one panel. Okay. But just using parts of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's endless ways to, to piece it together. Well, n normally I don't make drawings um, before I make a sculpture. I knew that how I was gonna approach this project was to, to carve the form first. Generally, I'll be doing it all at one time, but that can be inefficient. I mean, it can be fruitful, but it can be really inefficient, yeah. you know, because I'm constantly like, what am I doing today? Every day I'm like starting over, you know? <clears throat> so in this case, I start out with some ideas about just how a shape could be. And cause I knew I was going to have this block. I knew, you know, how big of a block can I glue up and, and kind of the, generally the proportions and the size, how I wanted it to be towards me, like I, how I am going to feel towards, you know, this mm -hmm. thing. So I, so I did these around, and then later I came back and drew from the, the piece that I ended up carving, which obviously isn't like any of these, you know, the pieces that I, I uh, started out with. And it just is a way to kind of, you know, as you walk around the piece, the form really changes and, right. and is, so, is very different. So when I was getting the form down, you know, I had a couple things that, I, that were necessary for me. I did want this sense of, as you go around it, it, it's, it feels like a different, you know, object from, like if you're taking photos that you, you might not know it's the same thing, right? Right. And also I wanted it to be somewhat of a figure, but nothing that would be a clear reference, mm -hmm. right? So whether it's male, female, whether it's, I mean, it could be like a giant morel mushroom now that I look at yeah. it right now, but you know, it's, um, whether it's human or yeah. you know, natural, or right. Or chimera or yeah I just wanted it to be open but also trigger some references that you know which I think you can't help but to do so you know once I felt like I had that then I start working the surface you know you've so you've already got these kind of undulating lines before it's carved and then the surface is gonna like kind of fly over that it's gonna add more kind of buzz to that surface and activate it and then as I carve, you know, if I want to soften, I can go in with the sander and soften some of the lines, you know, so that like, for instance, over here, when these were carved, like, uh, I'll show you. So, um, as so I take this little gouge, let's see, why should I do this? So when you cut in, you get a pretty hard edge there, right? So part of what I'm thinking about with the casting, it's, it's going to be a little different than 
with the wood where when I'm, when I'm using, when it's with the wood, I do want these edges um, to catch the, the graphite when I'm using that. And if there's a lot of rounded edges, it doesn't catch that as much. But with the bronze and it being a patina, it's going to be different, you know? And so I can soften those like I did here with the sander. Um, with, uh... So I've just got it here and just kind of... Oh, interesting. So, because what I'm thinking when it's going to be in metal, it's going to be a different thing. And it could be a little intense if it was all these real hard edges. So I'm, I'm trying to... Um, Make it, you know, work with the, uh, with that material in mind, um, or at least predict that. So, and then when I'm outlining, I'm using like one of these. So let's let me get this this piece that I just did. And usually while I'm doing this, <clears throat> I have uh, the news on or music. Yeah. It's just more of like, I think about it like if there's layers of, of oppositional forces in my work, it's like flipping between one version of the truth and another version of the truth. And uh, just letting that be all in one thing. Um. So I know we talked about um, the stencils that you use kind mm -hmm. of for their more abstract properties once you, you know, eventually fold them onto your mm -hmm. sculptural surface. But, you know, in speaking about the news and how that kind of infiltrates your space as you're working, mm -hmm. do you think there is, you know, some kind of cultural or, you know, political um, viewpoint that comes out in your work? Yeah, I think so. I don't think it's... Um I try not to have it, a lot of times I'll start with a, like something maybe I'm angry about or, or something that I'm interested in. And um, usually it evolves into a more um, complicated perspective as I'm making work. And if it doesn't, I feel like it's just too simple. You know, it's just, uh, why does it need to be a piece of artwork? You know, it could just be, I don't know, a poster. Although I have my opinions about who's right and wrong. <laughs> As a citizen. Yeah. As a citizen, I do. You know, I caucus, I'm involved, I go to vote. But as an artist, um, um, it has to go into a different place for me than just um, where I'm at in my political beliefs, right. you know, and what I'm willing to fight for, you know. Yeah. But it's in there, and... I hope it's all that stuff mixed up and kind of clashing with each other and you know, eating each other. Yeah. You know?
join us again on Common Ground. If you have an idea for Common Ground in North Central Minnesota, email us at legacy at lptv.org or call 218-333-3014. To watch Common Ground online, visit lptv.org and click Local Shows. To order episodes or segments of Common Ground, call 218-333-3020. Production funding of Common Ground was made possible in part by First National Bank Bemidji, continuing their second century of service to the community, a partnership for generations, member FDIC. Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, with money by the vote of the people November 4th, 2008. If you watch Common Ground online, consider becoming a member or making a donation at lptv.org.